The educator Dr. Maria Montessori once said, The child developing harmoniously and the adult improving himself at his side make a very exciting and attractive picture. Welcome to Montessori Education with me, Jesse McCarthy, where we talk raising children and educating students while bettering ourselves right alongside them. First, um, quick apologies to my regular listeners. I am about a week late, and my only excuse is that my mind has been on the craziness of American culture right now, which I will actually be talking about. I mean, literally just a few minutes ago, a friend texted me and said that you know he's in L.A. and that downtown they are boarding up all of the stores and businesses and so forth um, in preparation for tomorrow's election. Um, I hope next week's guests will make up for the wait. I am actually really excited to be speaking with her. Now today, what I'm going to do is share a kind of crazy story for me from when I was an early teacher about this thing called color competition. And then afterward, I'll talk about how it's related to Maria Montessori's view of peace and politics. So years ago, um, I taught elementary and junior high. And at our school, we'd have this one day that the kids just loved. And, you know, my colleagues and I did too. It was called color competition. We'd split up the students and the teachers into two colors or groups. It'd be the green team and the blue team. And for like half of the school day, we'd have all sorts of fun games to compete in. You know, obstacle courses, water balloon tosses, uh, tape the teacher to the wall, that kind of thing. One year, I think we even played a full-on soccer game. It was rad. So the week before the big day, we'd tell the students what team they were on. And then, of course, they'd run up to their favorite teachers asking them, you know, what team are you on? What team are you on? Now, this was all before I really understood young children. So I'd actually go around to some kids playfully saying, we're going to beat you guys so bad. Like, I remember teaming up with, like, the tiniest fourth grade girl and walking up to a group of older boys on the opposite team and being like, she and I, we are going to mop the floor with you guys. You know, that kind of thing. And I thought it was all fun and games. I wasn't yet aware that some of the youngest fourth and fifth graders could really take to heart some of this taunting. Anyway, along with this this jeering, some of us teachers would do, um, we also went all out the night before the big color competition day by making a mess of the school with our respective color. So there would be you know, blue flyers and ribbons everywhere, or maybe all the different color whiteboard markers would be replaced with only green ones, or blue and green paint on the parking spots. It was actually really a blast, until one year um, when it wasn't. Things got out of hand. You see, what I didn't realize back then but what I know all too well now is that some children can easily get themselves, almost their identities, wrapped up in things, like what color team they are on. In this case, little did I know that a small group of boys were taking the whole color competition way too seriously. So when they were telling me that, no, we're gonna whoop you, Mr. McCarthy, they weren't kidding. They wanted to win with passion. Well, the big day came around this one year, and as always, we tried our best to make the teams as even as possible. This time, we really succeeded, um, as it was super close to terminating the winner. So after the last event finished, we gathered all the children together on the main blacktop outside the school, which was basically our parking lot back then. So you've got about 70 or 80 kids from maybe 8 years old to 14 split down the middle according to colors. One side blue, the other side green. And on each side, you know, standing with them according to color were us teachers. And then there was a school administrator, you know, kind of as a referee in the middle announcing the scores of each event over a megaphone so everyone could hear. And now she's adding them all up to see who the overall winner is, green or blue. And she says into this megaphone, with a huge smile. And the winner is the green team. Now, I don't actually recall if it was green or blue that won, but the the team color really isn't important. What's important is how one child reacted. 
a boy, um, fifth grader, so maybe 10 years old. I'm going to call him David. He flipped out. So among the excited shouts of triumph from the greens and some you know, sad looks from the blues comes this screaming, no, no, they cheated. I saw them cheat. So David was losing it. Again, this was early days for me, so I didn't know what to do. Um, I just tried to reason with him, which on a side note, I know now is not helpful. So I'm like, it's all good, David. You'll, you'll get him next year, man. His response was immediate and righteous. No, they are cheaters. A few others and I kept trying to calm him down, like in the worst way, of course, by saying, calm down. But he wasn't having it. Like He's like, no. And at this point, he just broke down crying. Like he was mumbling about how unfair it all was and how the other team were just a bunch of cheaters. A few of his teammates kind of started supporting his point. Um, you know, like, yeah, maybe they did cheat. While a few of the players on the other team, so, you know, in this case, it's the green color, started yelling back, no, we didn't cheat. Nobody cheated. Come on. Everyone else, the overwhelming majority, were kind of standing around like, what the heck? And just not knowing what to do. It was a bizarre situation. So what I remember thinking was insane at the time was how certain I was that, like, if David were on the other team in that moment, he would have been gloating. He would not at all have been concerned about the potential of his own team cheating. Like, in other words, concern for truth was out the window either way. His judgment about cheating would be completely dependent on what team he was on. Um, so if he was losing, say, on the blue team, as in this case, well, the greens are a bunch of cheaters. But if he had been on the winning green team, then it would have been the opposite. Well, no cheating here. Like, that scared me a little. So... Stepping away for a moment from children in this color competition, do you know any adults like this? Say when things don't go the way they want, they blame others? Maybe this is even you at times. Like, I know I'm not completely above it. And beyond adults, can you think of a culture that has somewhat become like this? Now, I'll answer that one for you. America, or at least America online and in the news. Like, it's gotten so bad among us adults that some are in fear for the immediate future of the country if the, quote, other side gets elected. And this concern has been all-encompassing for months, as most of you know. Now, my related question for today is, is it possible that there's something much deeper going on wrong here than one's politics? Maria Montessori would definitely say so. And she'd point to a more fundamental failure of ours. That is, how we are with children. As she famously said, quote, Establishing a lasting peace is the work of education. All politics can do is keep us out of war. End of quote. In other words, you know, see, police officers can catch a thief in the act of trying to rob a house. But what would be much better is if the man or woman never grew up to be a criminal to begin with. Now, I'm not talking fantasy land here when you know, no one ever does anything bad in society, but instead that it's important we try to delve into the root causes of things, the source of troubles, not merely try to put band-aids on them. So what is the answer to today's raging right versus left battle? Or in a more positive light, you know, regardless of politics, what could help us all get closer to peace and civility, which every sane person is craving right about now? Montessori's view is very clear. Quote, within the child lies the fate of the future. End of quote. And this wasn't hyperbole. Like, she wasn't just being flowery. Maria Montessori meant those words. As she noted in so many ways throughout her books and speeches, if we do not deal with our problems in childhood, they will haunt us as adults. This is why when you know, talking about peace and freedom, Montessori rarely discussed politics. Not because she didn't care about it, 
she was immensely concerned with conflicts of the day. And for instance, she championed women's rights way before it was popular to do so. But still, she viewed politics as secondary. For her, if we don't deal with our foundational problems, specifically bettering how we are with children and with ourselves, no amount of politics will fix things. So I'll share a related passage on this, actually some of, I'd say, the darkest words I've ever read from Montessori. Quote, It is the adult who produces in the child his incapacities, his confusion, his rebellion. It is the adult who shatters the character of the child and deprives it of its vital impulses. And more than that, it is the adult who affects to correct the errors, the psychological deviation, the lapses of character that he himself has produced in the child. So we find ourselves in a labyrinth without an exit, in the presence of a failure without hope. Until the adults consciously face their errors and correct them, they will find themselves in a forest of insoluble labyrinths, and children, becoming in their turn adults, will be victims of the same error, which they will transmit from generation to generation. End of quote. Now that is dark. So how do we get out of the labyrinth or maze? Well, Montessori has an answer for that. Quote, the child brings us light amid the shadows that surround us. End of quote. She saw that so many of our personal problems stem from childhood. And likewise, our culture can be a mirror reflecting how we treat children. Very similar, um, actually, to a famous saying of Nelson Mandela. Quote, there can be no keener revelation of a society's soul than the way in which it treats children. End of quote. So when Montessori sought to promote peace in the world, she didn't focus on politics, but rather on the child. And that's both the child in front of us and the child within us. So I'll give you two quick examples that might highlight this in America today, you know, of having a slant toward children. The first one, how many people do you know who will talk about just how important freedom is in a political context, yet will send their children to a school where they have to sit still in a desk, listening to an authority figure tell them what is true and false for hours every day, with just a few breaks in between. I mean, we're talking teenagers who literally have to raise their hand to go to the bathroom. I mean, so after you know these boys and girls have over a decade of this kind of non-freedom in education, do you think once you know, that final school bell rings and these now young men and women come running out into the real world, that they'll know what to do with the freedom they find? How can we honestly promote political freedom if we're unwilling to help children develop the capacity to actually live free? And, and I'm not immune to this. I mean, I once was that teacher authority in the stifling traditional system, which so many American parents still send their kids to. Or I'll give you another example of kind of how we can fail to see the conflict between our political and personal selves, how we can get so wrapped up in Washington that we lose perspective in our own homes. So how many people do you know who protest what they see as the, the injustices in society, say police brutality, and then turn around and become dictators to their own children? yelling at and even hitting them for, quote, being bad or just not listening? The answer is a lot. And I'm not saying if you do this, you're some, you know, immoral person. I mean, back in the 80s, my own mom and dad yelled at and, and hit me at times, and I still love them dearly. But it has an impact. And all I'm really getting at is that we hold serious contradictions between the political lives we live and it's especially true online with one another, and our personal lives at home and school with children. And according to Maria Montessori, if we don't consciously face our errors and correct them, then children, quote, becoming in their turn adults, will be victims of the same error, which they will transmit from generation to generation, end of quote. So we have to focus on and work to fix our own problems. Instead of being stuck in a, 
you know, political blame game. Montessori once shared a related parable on this, and it's about a king who wished to reform his kingdom. She noted how he sent for his counselors, and one of them, who was wiser than the others, said, quote, first you must reform yourselves, you and your court, end of quote. In other words, instead of coming up with grand ideas about saving our country and the world, politicians, and all of us really, could start a little closer to home by looking within ourselves for areas that need improvement. It is a question of reforming the reformers, said Montessori. And she concluded with, we all need to be changed. Now Montessori believed, and I definitely agree with her, that one vital way to reform ourselves, and to get out of this labyrinth, is to look to children for aid. As she put it, quote, our social mentality has not grasped the idea that we can receive help from the child, that the child can give us a light and a lesson, a new vision and a solution for inextricable problems, end of quote. And also, quote, everybody speaks about the reform of society, but it is man himself who needs to change, something which we are starting to realize, the reform of man through the child, end of quote. I'll give you um, a kind of quick and visceral example of what Montessori is getting at. So back in September, you know, I watched the first presidential debate. And like many of you out there, I was shocked. I mean, actually grossed out is probably more fitting. But then something came to my mind. What if sitting below Donald Trump and Joe Biden on stage in the front row of the audience, there were children watching and listening to their supposed debate? right there, live in front of them. Do you think those two men would have acted differently? No, I'm not sure, but there is a very good likelihood that they would have. And why is that? Well, I think, as Montessori once said, quote, the child can change the hearts of men. In the midst of children, their hardness disappears, end of quote. Again, this isn't foolproof, but emotionally, I think it it probably rings true for most of us. So the more in touch we are with children, the more we think about and understand their nature and their needs and their innocence, the better we are as adults and as potential role models. Now, this is not to somehow say children can solve all of our problems, not the case, or that politics isn't important. It surely is. I mean, as a monumental example, um, of just the wonderful power of good government in our recent times. Think about the Supreme Court ruling back in 2015 that all state bans on same-sex marriage were unconstitutional. That is incredible progress for this country and for the world, really. But even there, like, what made us as adults think that it was right to not allow two consenting individuals to be married in the first place? I'm definitely not going to dive into all that, but I can confidently say it's connected with something more fundamental than politics. And for sure, it's related to childhood, particularly to the beliefs some of our parents and grandparents handed down to us. Incidentally, on an important note here, like with everything I'm talking about, I am deliberately using words like us, our, and we. I mean, I don't often do this regarding positions I strongly disagree with. Like normally I wouldn't put myself in a group that was against gay marriage or that hits children or that believes traditional schooling is good. But the fact is, given the insanely divisive state of America today, between Democrat and Republican and conservative and liberal, I think right now it's important to see ourselves as one, trying to work together to solve our united problems. Because as Lincoln famously put it, a house divided against itself cannot stand. And seriously, think for a moment of America as a household. What would happen if mom and dad are shouting at one another every single day, blaming the other person for all the problems in the family, really for all the problems in life, period? It would be a mess. And it might even end up in domestic violence. And tragically, in such you know, real-world situations, guess who's most forgotten? 
Yeah, children. Maria Montessori spent her life's work with one simple message. Look at the child. And today, we are failing to do this. Our culture is so wrapped up in politics, so glued to biased news on both sides of the spectrum, so addicted to our social media echo chambers, like so righteous about what our neighbors should or should not be doing, that we have lost sight of the most important segment of our society for our future, children, who are, of course are standing right beside us watching everything we do, hearing every word we say, absorbing it all. Now, given that image like, of children taking in everything right next to us, here's a question. Are we being the models we want to be for them? Are we being our best selves? I mean, this might sound corny, but how many of you can stand in front of a mirror and genuinely say, I love the person I am? You see, the mirror does not lie. And if we don't truly love ourselves, if we're not dealing with stuff from our own childhood that needs fixing, if we're not constantly growing and becoming genuinely proud of the individuals we are, then what kind of crooked vision might we be passing down to our children and students? They need upright individuals who focus on the betterment of themselves and of their surroundings, not whiny people busy trashing one another. I raise this because when I turn on the news, I don't see a lot of genuine self-love or heroes for children to look up to. What I see all too often is self-righteous hatred of others, which if, if I'm being blunt, that often just exposes a pitiful undercurrent of hatred of one's own self. It's much like David in that color competition. It was easier for him to say that, you know, the quote, other side cheated and for, for him to feel justified in his anger than it was for him to look within. Now, happily, at 10 years old, David's issues can be solved pretty easily. For one, he doesn't need an idiot teacher egging him on about how he's going to get whooped. That wasn't too helpful for his growth. In our case, though, as adults, it, it's a little bit harder to solve inner conflicts. They're not so easy to resolve. But I'm not asking for each of us to be perfect overnight. All I'm asking is to not pretend that the faults are all on the, quote, other team. As Americans today, I think that is one of the greatest lies we are telling ourselves. It's always someone else's fault, some other group. It's rarely ever our own selves. So, you know, wrapping up here, I want to actually close with what's written on Maria Montessori's gravestone in Nordrick, Netherlands. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that right. Um, the inscription reads, quote, I beg the dear, all-powerful children to join me in creating peace in man and in the world, end of quote. I don't think it's an accident that for Montessori, peace in man comes before peace in the world. For the reality is we cannot expect peace in society when we are not yet peaceful in ourselves. Um, here's Montessori with some of the most honest and uplifting words I've ever heard from her. Quote, the real danger threatening humanity is the emptiness in men's souls. All the rest is merely a consequence of this emptiness. Man, the creature who flies through the heavens, who captures the music of the spheres, who is possessed of a power bordering on omnipotence, complains of being weak, ineffectual, and unhappy? Education is enormously important today because man possesses much more than he knows and much more than he can enjoy. He has everything. He must learn to appreciate what he has, to enjoy what he already possesses. End of quote. Okay, that's what I have for you today. Kind of heavy, um, but I think we need Montessori's guidance more than ever. You know, look at the child. And that's both the child beside us and within us. If you appreciate what I've said today, please like it or write me a comment or share with others, whatever you think is best. And if you're curious about the sources of quotes I've used, um, I'll post them on the episode page. 
Now, there should be a link to that where you're listening right now, but if not, you can find it with a little detective work at MontessoriEducation.com. And with that, here is to our bright future. And I, I really mean it. Like, even if America seems like a big mess right now, I'm personally super optimistic about our long-range future. I mean, I have confidence that together, as adult and child, we can find our way out of the labyrinth and get back to, to having fun again in our culture, you know, having some general and sincere goodwill toward one another. Well, my best to everyone out there and adios for now.